Hello, my dear students. I'm Dr. Vaishali Parandi. I've been teaching anatomy for last 25 years and I love it. Today, I'm going to talk about knee joint 2. Which, there's a request to all of you. Please sit with patella, femur and tibia of the same side. Ready. So when I teach you movements at the knee joint, you should be ready with the balls. Students, in my lecture 1, knee joint lecture 1, I've already covered introduction, classification, bones forming the joint. In knee joint 2, we're going to cover all this. Bursae, movements, arterial supply, nerve supply and so on. Okay. And finally, there will be a knee joint 3 in which I will be demonstrating how to show movements between femur and tibia. So, let's dive into the topic. Students, before I start, I want you to remember that this is knee joint. One of the most clinically relevant joints you are taught. Take this seriously. Learn every small nuance that I am giving you. Use it well. Okay. Right. So let's talk about knee joint and take a look at these ligaments. Okay. Just once I am going to show, tell you that between the femur and the tibia, there is a very less congruency. So you have to have a lot of ligaments which are going to hold these two bones together. So supporting the joints from outside are five ligaments. Outside there is a strong capsule, anteriorly there is ligamentum patelli, medially and laterally there is tibial and uh, fibulocollateral ligament, posteriorly there is oblique popliteal ligament and arcuate ligament. After you have studied the outside, you go inside and study the internal ligaments. What are the ligaments inside? Articular cartilages, menisci. The menisci are held in place by three ligaments, coronary, transverse and menisco-femoral ligament. The, all this has been covered in my earlier lecture. Let's now talk about the last two ligaments, synovial membrane and anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Right. So now common sense tells you that it's a synovial joint. Therefore, it will be lined by synovial membrane at all places where there is no articular cartilage or meniscus. This much you could have told even without me teaching you, you know this much. However, the synovial membrane comes inside the joint cavity forming what is called as the intercondylar septum. Let's take a look to understand what this is. This is the upper surface, the tibial plateau. Okay? The orange line is your synovial membrane. It lines the joint cavity and posteriorly comes inside the joint cavity forming the intercondylar septum, enclosing which two ligaments? Look at them and answer, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. So note, put an asterisk, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments are intracapsular but extra synovial. Yes, they are extra synovial because the synovial membrane has come and grasped them so that they remain outside the synovial cavity. Okay. Posteriorly, can you see that the synovial membrane also forms a pouch around the popliteus muscle, allowing for easy movement of popliteus. In the front, the synovial membrane also forms a fold called infrapatellar fold. And now, if you look carefully, you can see a gap between the infrapatellar fold and the intercondylar septum. This gap is called as intercondylar foramen, through which the two sides, femorotibial compartments communicate with each other. Don't worry, I'm going to do this again, you will understand. Right. So now this is a sagittal section through the knee joint. Okay, femur, tibia, just orient yourself. Coming from posteriorly is the intercondylar septum, dividing the femorotibial compartment into lateral and medial femorotibial compartments. Anteriorly, there is an infrapatellar fold coming in. And in between these two, there is an intercondylar foramen. This diagram shows this well if you look at it carefully. Okay. So, also you can see how the synovial membrane goes up to form the suprapatellar bursa between the quadriceps muscle and the femur. Right. So, now we come to division of the femorotibial compartment. Basically, in knee joint is a femorotibial compartment. The intercondylar septum here, divides it into lateral and medial femorotibial compartments. The two menisci divide each compartment into superior and inferior 
minisco femoral and minisco tibial compartments. I will do this once more with you. Take a look at this now. A vertical septum, the intercondylar septum, <coughs> divides the knee joint into lateral and medial femorotibial compartments. Then each femorotibial you want to divide by menisci like this into medial and lateral menisco femoral, medial and lateral menisco tibial compartments. Now you must be wondering, madam, why so many compartments? Why can't we just have one? The more you divide a joint into smaller compartments, the better is the synovial fluid flow and nourishment and health of the joint. That is why this has been done for your crucial knee joint. Let's quickly revise your synovial membrane now. The synovial membrane lines everywhere, in all parts of knee joint, not covered by articular cartilages or menisci. It forms posteriorly an intercondylar septum, which helps to divide the joint into two femorotibial compartments. Anteriorly, this intercondylar septum encloses the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Anteriorly, there is a fold coming in called infrapatellar fold. The two sides therefore communicate between the, these two folds, the intercondylar foraminous fold. Here is the intercondylar septum fold and intercondylar foramen again. Okay, So that synovial membrane, what does it do? Why such a complicated membrane? What is it going to do ma'am? Yes, it's going to secrete synovial fluid and it's going to perform phagocytosis. So if you have a knee problem, the whatever particulate matter that is generated is phagocytosed by your synovial membrane. It's an extremely crucial function. Fine. So let's go to the famous anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. All of us have somebody or the other who has an ACL tear, isn't it? So let's talk about it. Okay, this is a very common short note, so be prepared for that as well. Okay, so that's the anterior cruciate, that's the posterior cruciate, enclosed in the intercondylar septum, crossing, therefore called cruciate. So you know why the name is there. Let's talk about attachments. Anterior cruciate ligament takes origin on the anterior part of tibial plateau. Posterior takes origin on the posterior part of the tibial plateau. Both the ligaments now begin to travel upwards. Take a look at these images, use them to understand. Anterior ligament travels upwards and posterior. Posterior ligament travels upwards and anterior. And finally enter into the intercondylar space in femur. Wait. They enter into this intercondylar space and get attached on adjacent sides of femur and tibia. Okay, Anterior getting attached to the lateral femoral condyle, posterior getting attached on the medial femoral condyle. Okay, We will do this once more. Don't think I am just going to let you go like that. This is important. We will do it again. Right. So, ACL attachments anterior cruciate ligament. Referred to as ACL uniformly, it's not my short, uh, short form, it's uniformly used short form. ACL, origin from the anterior part of the tibial plateau, fibers go upwards and posteriorly, inserted on the lateral condyle on the intercondylar space posteriorly. Okay. This ligament is stretched during extension. So, when you are extending your knee, the ACL is stretched and it acts like a axis around which the femur rotates on tibia. What function does it perform? It helps to prevent, one second, it helps to prevent forward dislocation of the tibia. It helps to prevent forward dislocation of the tibia. Now, let's injure it. Hmm? Okay. And that makes you happy, isn't it? Okay. So, here... Can you see how the moment the ACL is torn, the tibia moves forward? Okay, this is the very action the ACL prevents. Okay, now let's go to PCL, posterior cruciate ligament. A origin from the intercondylar space, tibial plateau, posterior. Posterior name hai, to posterior attachment. It travels forwards and anteriorly, gets attached on the medial condyle of femur in the intercondylar space. When is it stretched? During flexion. 
What function does it perform? It prevents posterior dislocation of tibia. Please note this. I'll tell you why it matters. Now, if you see how the PCL is damaged, let's do this once more. When the PCL is damaged, the tibia becomes posteriorly mobile. Okay? Can you see that? Or fine. So now, how will you check the patient? Patient says, something happened, ma'am, I am completely unable to pass over. Put any weight on my this knee. Then you ask the patient to lie down and you gently tug on the tibia forwards. If the tibia moves forwards, this is the anterior drawer sign. Similarly, for PCL tear, just gently push the tibia posteriorly. If it moves, it is posterior drawer sign. This is how you examine ACL and PCL tears. Okay, when is ACL torn? Look at this beautiful diagram. You can see how the ACL is torn here. How did it happen? It happened when the knee was hyperextended. Look at him. Look at this way his knee is. It's extended and the lower person is literally rotating his tibia. This is tearing his ACL. This is how ACLs get torn. In an extended position, either femur or tibia rotate abnormally, it tears your ACL. Similarly, now here what are you seeing? You are seeing this guy going and hitting the tree. The dashboard is coming back, pushing the tibia posteriorly. Who will be torn? Who prevents posterior tears? Posterior cruciate ligament. So when this forcible posterior pushing of tibia is done, the, the PCL tears. Now when you ask the patient to lie down and lift up his leg, the tibia has a clear lag because it is starting to fall downwards, resulting in a hyperextended knee joint. Clearly indicative of posterior cruciate ligament tear. Right. So what have we learnt? We've learnt about ligaments that were supporting the knee from outside. Then we've learnt about ligaments that were supporting the knee from inside. Articular cartilages, menisci, coronary transverse and meniscofemoral ligaments. Today we studied synovial membrane which divides my joint into four compartments which are intercommunicating. And I learnt about anterior posterior cruciate ligaments. What should I remember? I should remember all these ligaments and be prepared for a menisci short note and an anterior posterior cruciate ligament short note. Right. So, one more commonly asked question, enumerate all the intracapsular, intraarticular structures of knee joint. That means between femur and tibia, what are the structures in the articular space? So, look at this image, it tells you the answer. You can see that anterior posterior cruciate ligaments, tendon of popliteus, the two menisci, the coronary ligament, the transverse ligament and the synovial membrane and folds. Also, you should remember one ligament which is not there in the image, menisco-femoral ligament. All these are intra-articular structures in the knee joint. Fine. So, what have we learnt up till now? We are done with the ligaments. We now move on to bursae of the joint. Now, remember students, when you open your books, you are going to find loads of bursae. Do you have to read all of them? I will leave the choice to you. But I am going to tell you the ones that really are discussed and uh, clinically relevant. So, first thing is what is a bursa? A bursa is a synovial bag full of synovial fluid, allowing for free movement between skin and bone, between two muscles, between muscle and bone and so on. So, there are many bursae around the knee joint. My advice, you don't have to know all of them. Just know that they exist. I am going to show you the ones which are clinically relevant. So, here you are seeing a pre-patellar bursa. Below the patella, there are two infrapatellar bursas. Subcutaneous infrapatellar, deep infrapatellar. Above the patella, there is a suprapatellar bursa. Okay. Now, let's discuss why are they relevant. Here you are seeing a pre-patellar bursa. Now, just imagine a maid who is on her knees as seen here, wiping the floor. All the time her pre-patellar bursa is rubbing against the bone and the skin. It gets inflamed, resulting in what is called as pre-patellar bursitis, which is also called as housemaid's knee. So, in common MCQ is 
housemaid's knee is inflammation of x y z bursa you have to recognize which one it is okay so the next bursa i want you to concentrate on is subcutaneous infrapatellar bursa this is under pressure when you are in a kneeling down position for example a clergyman when he is kneeling down and praying his bursa is all the time there between the bone and the underlying tissue getting inflamed resulting in subcutaneous infrapatellar bursitis also called as clergyman's knee okay for these mcqs i request all of you to go to my website i'm going to put up all these mcqs for you to solve right now let's take a look at this another bursa and serine bursa between the underlying tibial collateral ligament and the overlying three tendons sgs can you tell me which ones those are sartorius gracilis semi tendinosus between these two there is a bursa called anserine bursa this can get inflamed causing a condition called ans pes anserine bursitis now Let's take a look at a condition called Baker's cyst. Sometimes your knee joint is so inflamed and there is so synovial fluid there that it slowly escapes posteriorly deep to your semimembranosus muscle or sometimes between your semimembranosus and medial head of gastrocnemius. This is called Baker's cyst. Remember Baker's cyst is treatable, but you have to go to the cause of the problem why Baker's cyst is getting formed. Right. So let's now. What have we covered? We are done with the bursae. Let's talk about movements and muscles producing the movements. Okay. So movements are very easy. Do you need me to teach you movements? I hope not. Everybody knows that knee joint undergoes extension and flexion. Extension is associated with a conjunct medial rotation. That is new. Extension is associated with a conjunct medial rotation. flexion is associated with a conjunct lateral rotation what do i mean by conjunct conjunct something that happens because of the shape of the bony surfaces it is not something you are doing consciously whereas there is also an adjunct rotation adjunct is some a medial rotation you can take perform at the knee joint consciously okay when you are you are sitting in a flex knee position like you are doing now just see if you can rotate your tibia on your femur yes you can that's adjunct medial rotation and adjunct lateral rotation consciously rotating movements right so now take your femur and tibia in your hands students and let's go to the next part of the class which is movements okay so let's begin by extreme flexion are you ready come on so that's my tibia that's my femur i know they are of the same side do you know that the bones you are holding are of the same side check that now articulate them together and get your femur in and tibia in extreme flexion okay so now let's see what happens pay attention students this is very important okay hold the tibia and femur in flex position and let's begin to do this movement as the femur begins to perform its extension movement it first rolls on the surface of tibia can you see that the surface is over now femur can no longer rotate any further tibial articular surface is over now what does the femur do it spins in place it doesn't roll it spins in place okay so how did we do this we started with a rolling movement of femur on the tibia once the tibial articular surface got over we got the femur to spin in place so roll and spin now let's see what happens after it has reached this space okay what the femur does is with the contraction of vastus medialis the femur begins to rotate medially like this what does it do it slowly rotates medially which muscle is contracting vastus medialis muscle is contracting okay so the femur rotates on the medial meniscus okay between the femur and the tibia whereas what is lateral meniscus doing lateral meniscus is merely being pulled forwards uh, by the lateral condyle of femur at one point you can no longer perform any movement and this is called as the locked knee we're going to do this again 
Okay, take a look at the screen now students. I'm going to rest this bone down. The movement begins with the femur rolling on the tibial surface, point number one. Then femur spins on the tibial surface, point number two. Then the femoral condyle rotates medially and backwards on the medial meniscus, on the medial meniscus. At the same time, lateral femoral condyle is gliding forwards, carrying the lateral meniscus with it. So, this end of this movement is called locking of knee joint. We will do this once more now. Extreme flexion, rolling, spinning. Vastus medialis contracting, medial rotation of the femur on the tibia on the medial meniscus and lateral meniscus is just being passively pulled forward by the lateral condyle. End of this movement is called as locking of knee joint. Right. Now your knee joint is locked. Okay. Now you want to finally flex your limbs again. You've had enough of extended knee, you want to flex. How do we do that? It's locked, right? You have to have a key. It's locked knee. How do we do that? Somebody has to first unlock the knee. Medial rotation was locking mechanism. Lateral rotation will be unlocking mechanism. Okay. So let's begin this movement. Understand it first. Then we'll perform the action. So medial femoral condyle rotates laterally on the medial meniscus. Who assists this? The fantastic popliteus muscle. It is the unlocker of your knee joint. Once the knee joint is unlocked, okay, on the medial meniscus, the lateral meniscus is again gliding backwards passively. After that, you will begin. This is unlocking of knee joint. Now, you remember how we went roll, spin, medial rotate. So, when we come back, it is lateral rotate, spin and roll. So, now the femur spins on the con tibial condyles and rolls on the tibial condyles to come back to flexion. Let's do this now. This is my extended knee. Okay. So first step will be lateral rotation. Who is assisting? Popliteus. After there is, after the lateral rotation, the lateral meniscus has passively moved back in place. It has not got much of a role to play here. Now next step has to be spinning in place. And the last step will be rolling in place and we are back to flexed knee. Let's do this one last time from flexion. Roll, spin, medial rotate, vastus medialis. Popliteus, lateral rotate, spin and roll. That's how your femur and tibia actually act against each other. Fine. Keep the bones away. Look at the image here. If you want to do this quickly, how to do it? Okay. So from flex position, extend, medially rotate. Vastus medialis. From extended position, laterally rotate, popliteus and flex. That's These are the basic ways in which you can move the femur and the tibia, locking and unlocking mechanism. Okay. So muscles bringing about various movements. Students, this is extremely easy. I'm sure you know it. I'm just going to run through it. You know that your knee is extended by your massive quadriceps and locked by your vastus medialis. You know that it is unlocked by your popliteus, helped by your hamstrings, which are flexors of knee joint. The question is, who causes adjunct medial rotation? Who causes adjunct lateral rotation? Adjunct medial rotation are SGS. Sartorius gracilis semitendinosus assisted by semimembranosus. Lateral rotation, adjunct lateral rotation is by bicep femoris. This I think is easy and if you don't know it, then you have to go back to studying gross anatomy again. Okay, because this is very simple actions. Right, so what have we covered? We've covered the muscles also. Now let's move on to arterial and nerve supply. Now, I'm not going to teach you this. You can see a massive anastomosis there. This is not the time to study the anastomosis. But it is the time to understand the necessity for anastomosis. I can see descending genicular artery. I can see descending branch of lateral circumflex, saphenous artery, anterior tibial artery, circumflex fibular artery. 
and posteriorly fibula which is not there in the diagram. All these are causing this massive genicular anastomosis around the knee. Question is, why do we need it? Why is it there? It's there because when you do extreme flexion, the popliteal artery which is so deep is almost completely kinked. So who is going to supply blood to this very important joint at that time? So this anastomosis, this collateral anastomosis helps in that moment. So that is why human body has built this massive anastomosis. Nerve supply. Again, use your common sense. Don't bother to mug it up. From the quadriceps, there are three vasti. Femoral branches to vasti also supply the knee joint. From posteriorly, you got two nerves. Sciatic dividing into two, tibial and common peroneal. So three branches of tibial, three branches of common peroneal. You got nine nerves already in place. Tibial will give rise to superior, middle and inferior genicular. Common peroneal will give rise to superior and inferior genicular along with recurrent genicular. Finally, there is one branch of posterior division of obturator nerve. You must be thinking, ma'am, it's okay. It is your profession to know nerve supply. <laughs> yes, it's my profession, of course. But if you just think, there is nerve supply coming from the front, from the femoral branches. From behind, there is tibial and common peroneal. And there is obturator nerve. So, if you use some kind of logic, it's much easier to remember all this. Fine. So, let's come to applied anatomy. You must have seen this kind of knees where the knees come more close together than normal. That condition is called as genu valgum. When the knees are wide apart, as we call as bolex, okay, that's called as genu varum. Ah, this is something you're familiar with. The word is very commonly bandied around nowadays, arthroscopy. Arthroscopy is a procedure of diagnosing and treating joint problems without actually opening up the joint. The surgeon just injects a thin needle into the joint which is attached to a fiber optic video camera and the joint can be observed. The incision is hardly a buttonhole, tiny incision is done. This protects the patients by not opening up the knee joint to explore it. You can just do a arthroscopy. Uses are you can explore the knee joint. Not only that, you can also carry out repair on cartilages, menisci, ligaments and tendons. So it's quite an amazing technology that has come in. Finally, arthritis of knee. How many of you know a patient who has arthritis of knee? I don't think there's anybody who doesn't have a relative or a friend who has got arthritis of the knee. It's very, very common, unfortunately. So the kind of arthritis you see is when the cartilage is damaged, osteoarthritis. When the synovial membrane is inflamed, rheumatoid arthritis. When there is metabolic disturbance, there is gouty arthritis. What will you do for when there is, especially when the knee is very badly damaged, you do what is called as knee replacement. It's almost a fashion, isn't it? I don't think it is. Uh, it would be very much better if all of you kept on exercising enough not to allow your knee joint to reach the stage that is seen on the screen. Of course, diseases are diseases and need treatment. So knee joint is being replaced nowadays. Okay, study it well. It's a very commonly done surgery today. Right. So what did we cover today? We talked about two ligaments, synovial membrane and the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Then we talked about bursae. Remember, housemaid's knee, clergyman's knee. Then we talked about movements at the knee joint, muscles producing the movement. We practice them on the bone as well. Then we talked about arterial and nerve supply and the applied anatomy. With this, students, I complete this lecture, Knee Joint 2. Uh, I request all of you to see Knee Joint 3, which is going to be a very short lecture or just a short. Okay, It will show you how to demonstrate the movements between femur and tibia, the locking and unlocking movements when they are asked in your exam. So your study of Knee Joint will be thus complete. Students, if you enjoyed this lecture, do please like and subscribe. It will encourage me to create more of such informative lectures for you, which will help you to learn, understand and recall much better. Thank you, my dear students. Remember, knee joint is one of the most clinically relevant joints. Please study this well. Go back, repeatedly see the joint. I have only a very short time in which I have to teach you this very important topic. 
pause at places, ponder on important points and become knowledgeable in knee joint. It was my pleasure to take this lecture and also I felt the responsibility of teaching this important joint. I hope you enjoyed it too. See you across the screen in some other video. Bye. Mm -hmm.